plants and vegetation types. And these include the ra proper rainforest, seasonal forest, decidual forest, flooded forest, and sa sandy savannas. And I'm telling this because all of those different, this mosaic, this mosaic of, of forests and habitat is actually driving by river flooding and flooding seasons and dry seasons. And because of this, the climate change will have like a very a huge impact for people and species living in this area. So uh, in some point, uh, I'm just getting back in, in the past, 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 is the story, the geological story about Amazon, which is kind of David Attenberg uh, presentation now. <laughs> so when, I love him. When, the, um, when we had Gondwana, the African and South America was connected, the Amazon River actually was a proto river of Congo in Zambia region. And in that time, the river flowed from the west to the east. But then 15 million years ago, when the Andes um, was formed by collision between the South American plate and Nazca plate um, and the rise of Andes, the river, we had like a linkage between Brazilian and Guiana bedrock shields, which blocks the river and cows and and cows the Amazon River became like an ocean in the middle of the continent because with these connections and gradually this this sea inland sea if we could say something like that became a massive swamp and freshwater lake and with marine uh, inhabitants they found like more or less twenty species of uh, stingray, for, for us it's like higher. Do you remember higher <laughs> for, in Portuguese? And, um, and this species is very connected to the passive species, uh, the passive ocean. So, and now they still are, they have adapted to the fresh water and this other species in the Amazon river uh, is related to those species from the ocean. And about 10 million years ago, the waters um, through the sandstones, they, they start to come from the, the west and before it was the west and then they become to flow to east. And this was the time then the Amazon forest uh, was born something like this. So because you have the ants and from Colombia, Venezuela in the limits, the river start to grow. The Amazon river start to grow and the forest and the sun, the soil was more sandy that we have a forest there. But then we had the ice age <laughs> and the sea level dropped and the Amazon lake became a river. And after 3 million years, um, the ocean level in, in ice, ice age was so low that exposed the Central American isthmus and the Panama isthmus, and then this promoted the migration of fauna flow from the south of America to the north and from the north to the south. There is lots of discussions um, about this, the big mammals in the so the north could come to the to the South America, but we lost lots of species between South America to to North America. But this is another discussion. But I'm trying to say this <laughs> to explain. Also, um, after the Ice Age, um, the forest was retreat, and there is a discussion. But most of the forest was isolated in Iceland, in patch, in the middle of the, the region, and savanna was grown, so it was expanded. And this separate the species, for, and the species which was separate, isolated for a long, long time, they had genetic differentiation, which after 
when the ice age ended, the species, if they were connected, they were not very genetically similar anymore. So because of this, the, we have separate species, but the, this, the number of species like the richness tell us how, bio, how big, how increased the biodiversity with this climate change. And all of these explanations that, I, that I'm telling to you now is to say that this process was, was just possible because we had species and we had lots of species with different uh, features and adaptive adaptability, which is what we need when we have like climate change and we and climate change is a process. Everything is a process in the world. Um, and anything could happen and change the climate because of special reasons or whatever. And I think, but the question is, when you have a species and you have genetic diversity, the process, the evolutionary process, they, they happen. It, it's, this process happens. But when you have loss of biodiversity, this process is not, is not possible because you don't have the resource, which is like the species and everything. So other thing important about the Amazon uh, on climate change, it's every, no, everybody knows this, that uh, the forest produce lots of water which is produced because the trees are breathing and by or transpiration and this water is consumed by the forest but also uh, part of this water goes to the other regions in in the countries not not only in the amazon region but for example we have you could you could google something called flying rivers and it would explain you the process. But for example, in Brazil, 70% of gross uh, natural products come from areas which receive this rain from Amazon forests. So this is the, is the picture about the forest and the kind of service, the forest, why we have to protect the forest and work together. And the other thing is like the state of art uh, that I tried to tell you is like when we in the Rio 1992, we had the Convention of, Diver of Biological Diversity, which is CDB, and was like an a international policy for conservation of biodiversity. And when they started to discuss like climate change as well, but was like a very discussion on climate change was really not, was starting, but loss of biodiversity was in the top of the discussions. And now we have like all of the conventions of parties in, which is like, we have like the convention of party, parties 15 this year for biodiversity. And we have, which will be in China. And we have a convention of parties 26 in Scotland, which is the convention of climate. So for those conventions, Brazil in the past was, the first conventions of biodiversity was in Rio and was many countries assigned and many countries put targets to follow uh, each 10 years to, to targets to, um, to try to save biodiversity in some way. And this means work, uh, science, and all of efforts and money to do this, this job, you know, to do this, to achieve this target, those targets. And now Brazil is so bad in the environmental policies and conservation policies that um, we were excluded from this convention. First, because the, our government tried to lie and, um, about the calendar, the, the schedule for the conventions in China, and they were asking that it's not possible to do um, um, online meeting 
to approve the, the schedule because we'll be excluding people, which is not a reason because everybody are doing, doing pandemic meetings and everything is working. So they try to block the, those conventions, the, 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 the process to approve those conventions. So, and also for conventions of uh, biodiversity, the countries have to present a plan uh, with ambitions, ideas and practical ideas, and also uh, showing how the country was achieving the past targets. And Brazil did nothing about this. So we were excluded to talk, the president actually, which I'm really glad because he doesn't know how to say, but it's very a shame that the country in the past was really leading the discussions with because the scientists in Brazil, the science is very strong, everything. So we have also Nagoya conventions which talk about the use the uh, share benefits from use of plants and everything. And cities convention, which is a convention to deal with um, international trade of uh, threatened species for fauna and flora. And Brazil also did like a, a jeopardize from this and sabotage and take off the list, uh, a very important species for Brazil, which is Ipe and which is used for make floors or furniture or something like this. So, yeah. So I'm telling about this because those conventions is very important because it's the, it's the method or is the way that countries could, could provide people working on it. So more opportunities uh, from, on jobs for including science or green jobs and more than in finance and also uh, improve resource for local, local and local production and develop of communities. Um, this is really important. It's like a kind of, when you have those agreements and targets to achieve, you, and the country is very, very committed to do this, is the way we can do this globally and together with resource from the governments and everything. So, and this is, means also like a more opportunity to young people to work more on, on science and conservation and green production, everything than in finance or, or like consumers thing or whatever. So, and to finish, just to say the predictions for climate change for Amazon countries under climate change is not good because the scientists is telling as the past, more areas will become more savanna because the cutting down forests and also the, the draw and also extreme events like fires, not because people is just putting fire in the, in the shrublands or something like this, but became, because all of the change in the environment, the fire will be spread uh, quickly because the, because the lack of rain or because the, the wind, something more physical than biological. And also this, oh, we have like more flooded areas by the river, which, which is like kind of, uh, the results will be dis displacement of uh, local communities, and which is not good. And also in a big scale in the world, we will have this like broadly migration of people uh, trying to escape and survive under like extreme events of flood or fires and everything. And the reductions of the, fall, the rainfalls for everybody means like low production, low food, and it's like this. It's just not a really good scent, <laughs> but it's, we have to deal with this. And I think ah, the most important thing is we cannot wait for socialism, <laughs> sadly, but we have to work on it even under capitalism 
we have to do something now because the predictions the scientists had in the past for 2050, 2040 to have the extreme events already start to happen. So in the, in the next decade, we are, see, we are going to see much more disasters than was predicted first for the first conventions. It's, it's so, yeah, we don't have time, <laughs> sadly, and we have to, to, to put this in the agenda of discussions to discuss ecocide and other things. Thank you. Sorry, the time. <laughs> Uh, a marvelous uh, contribution. Thanks. Thanks so much. Uh, just on the last point, um, it's uh, it's not as though socialism can be a distant objective in this sense. And let's discuss this. Um, in the, our approach, well, it's a, a general approach that uh, Trotsky has put over, but it's 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 there in all the Marxist literature. We we are looking to see transitional demands. In other words, you're putting forward ideas for change which will overcome capitalism or would confront and overcome capitalism. So let's discuss how we can put forward demands. You've mentioned so many good things that need to be done uh, to make sure that, you know, that's the way in which things develop and that all the countries that you mentioned can be in uh, coordinated action through working United Working Class Action because government's going to do nothing, as it seems. Yeah. You know? Okay, I'm so sorry to have to just chip in there and, and, and do that, but because of time, I'd like, to, um, we should have a discussion towards, after we've heard the three contributions, otherwise I'm afraid we're going to lose Nara, who's exhausted, and we might just uh, not, not uh, hear the end. Um, Nara, would you like to come in now? Mm. Yeah, that's fine, thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. Ra Raquel, Silvana, Roger. Dave, and um, nice to meet you, Maira. Welcome. I think we, we never met, so... Um, I'm just going to put time. And I just want to... Um, I, I put together some, some ideas, and uh, I, I, that's going to be refined anyway. So, but before I start to talk uh, about the, the local elections uh, that happened last year, uh, in October, I need to, to 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 draw a little bit to talk about a little bit about the background, what's going on in Brazil because Brazil it, we we're still in a cool mood in Brazil. So, uh, in 2016, there was uh, uh, the first woman president elected, Dilma Rousseff, who was impeached with absurd allegations, which uh, we know that they were not true. So after the impeachment, the Vice President Michel Temer took office and named a few military uh, as a minister to secure his stay in power. And then uh, there was a massive attack on Brazilian institutions, privatizations, cut and loss of rights. And there was a implement, uh, implementing uh, uh, um, uh, ultra neoliberal policies, like for example, the labor laws reforms attacking trade unions and which uh, lost two thirds of their income, uh, attacks on the state owned company Petrobras, changing of procurement rules, lifting the, the pr uh, protection of national industry, industry etc. And uh, another one which I, I, I listed as important, it was the they ended two uh, funds uh, uh, created by PT governments for the rainy days. And one of them is the royalty from oil ex exploration, which were bound to be invested in health and education. So based, they took from the health and education from the Brazilian people and they gave to Shell, to BP and all these other international uh, oil companies. So, uh, important to remember what was going on in Latin America and Caribbean. So just before the coup in Brazil, there was coup uh, in, um, in Paraguay and Honduras. And after Brazil, there was another one in Bolivia and some other problems in the South American countries. There was a massive prosecution of left-wing former presidents and, and popular leaders and activists. So this is known as a law fair. And uh, Rafael Correa, who is the former president of Ecuador, uh, who is also a victim of um, lawfare, 
Uh, and he said uh, uh, wisely that lawfare is today what the Condor operation was in the 60s and 70s in Latin America. Uh, it is important to understand the Condor operation was a CIA sponsored operation targeted left wing politicians, leaders, and activists from the left. And the luckiest ones were murdered by heart attack, car, or air crash. But most of them were uh, sent to prison, tortured, and executed. The survivors who managed to reach Europe told the story for the record. So, in Brazil, uh, just before the 2016 coup, um, Lula became the, the lawfare target led by a uh, judge called Sergio Moro, head of the car wash operation Lava Jato, which started in 2014 and destroyed hundreds of Brazilian companies in the infrastructure sector and its supply chain, causing unemployment of three to four million people. In 2017, Sergio Moro convicted Lula for corruption in a Kafkaian process in which the uh, which the lack of evidence, uh, sorry, I, I think I, I wrote something wrong in there, but um, the lack of, uh, I, there was uh, such a lack of evidence, uh, they, they couldn't find any, any evidence to, to convict him. And, they con and then in the end, he was convicted as an undetermined office act. Basically, they didn't have any, uh, anything to, to, to accuse them. They, they say undetermined, under undetermined, Determined uh, office acts, acts of the in the office. So, in January 2018, the High Court had con confirmed the conviction, increasing the sentence. And uh, in April 2018, he was arrested after the Supreme co uh, Supreme Court confirmed the legality of prison in second instance, before uh, uh, all appeals. So, with the, this controversial. Uh, decision, Lula was def definitely not allowed to run for president. So coincidence or not, uh, he was ahead of the, in the polls and this decision was overturned and Lula was released from prison in November 2019, although his con the conviction is still waiting for a few habeas corpus from Supreme Court, including cancellation of all trials due to judge Sergio Moro being a biased judge. It's, it's important to continue the fight to ensure Lula is granted full political rights and so he can run for president in 2022 elections. So without Lula, uh, that now we get to Bolsonaro because Bolsonaro was only elected because Lula was taken out from the, from the, um, from the, uh, the, the presidential election. So he won in 2018. With almost, 20, uh, with almost 28 million votes against 47 million from the PT's candidate, Fernanda Haddad. Uh, Bolsonaro's party, by then, uh, PSL, elected the largest number of MPs, followed by the PT. Many of PSL were people connected to paramilitary, neopetencostal churches, and police and armed forces. So Bolsonaro, supported by Trump, he started his mandate with many military in, as a minister and named Sergio Moro as a minister of justice, the judge who prevented Lula to be candidate against Bolsonaro. So he has since left the government and, uh, and there is not, uh, uh, because there, there was a, um, um, uh, there was a break in the, in the dialogue between the far right with the center right, which is connected to Sergio Moro. And then he left and now he's, uh, he's, he landed a job as a managing director of Alvarez and Marçal, uh, which the company is working in the administration of the largest Brazilian construction company called Odebrecht, uh, which had business in many countries around the world, especially in South America. The company went bust because of the car wash operation. So basically, again, it was uh, he got a job, landed a job, which is connected to his uh, the the operation he was leading as a judge. Okay, so this is uh, this is a bit of background. I'm gonna cut most many of this background, but I'm gonna uh, uh, summarize a bit a bit better. But uh, 
coming to the local elections uh, last um, October. So there is an understanding and how this uh, was not necessary. Uh, there was not necessarily a victory for Bolsonaro, but there was not 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 a victory for progressive parties either. So um, many individuals. Uh, the, the 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 analysis that the right and the center wing right were clear the winners of these local elections. So the pro progressive parties. Uh, particularly with PT, managed to stabilize this situation with losses and gains. I, I thought they, they could not be called winners. There is a long way uh, to organize. Yeah. And, um, and then according to PT analysis, uh, more uh, the, they say that they maintain the, 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 the position, the 2016 position. I thought they expected better results. And it does not mean that the election was a big defeat to the left. Any analysis of the results should take in consideration the exceptional conditions in, in what they were disputed, which um, surely influenced the results, favoring the parties linked to the federal government or linked to Bolsonaro, uh, which were most of the mayor were running for re-elections. And uh, the percentage uh, in, uh, increased from 45% in 2016 to 63% of success of re-elected uh, mayors. And many of them, they received the pandemic resources uh, ahead of the, of the election. So they, they used this re the, the, the use of the resource to, uh, to provide it to the population. This is, this is actually favored the, the current local government to helping them to be reelected. Uh, it's also important to highlight that um, uh, in the last hours of the 2018 elections, uh, there was a conservative uh, wave of message, intensive illegal use of social media and fake news had been repeated in 2020. And some government officials trying to make it this like as a normal thing, use of tools uh, to, to distort uh, the results of elections, use of the latest high tech and the strategy of big data, which we all know what is it. So, and abuse of economic and, and political power. So uh, that is, uh, there's a few, this is the few of the, uh, a bit of the analysis from, from PT, okay, uh, for the local elections. And, uh, and finally, I just would like to add something uh, because uh, it's important and uh, I think that is uh, someone should talk about this. Uh, I, I won't be able to do, to put this in the, in the, in the, in the, in my contribution because the, what, the, the, the COVID, COVID is being affected badly the Brazilian economy and, and Bolsonaro has shown no commitment in addressing the situation and the position approved as emergency benefit through parliaments was 600 reais, which is the local currency, which now has been cut to 300. And we will see the effects from, uh, from January now onwards. And the official number of unemployment is high, is 14%. And we take, in account, uh, we, we take into account people who has lost their jobs, but not normally looking for work. This could be as high as 30 million people in Brazil looking for um, a job. So Bo Bolsonaro's management of COVID is appalling. Brazil is the second wave, is in the second wave of COVID. And there is almost 200,000 uh, 200, uh, deaths. Uh, Brazil is in the second, uh, second deaths around the world, so in second place. And um, at the moment, the north region is in chaos, especially the city of Manaus. And uh, we, I think, this uh, this question of COVID needs to be uh, it needs to be addressed, really. Um, and uh, finally, I would like to talk. There's something going on now. Is the um, elections for the leadership of uh, of the Brazilian Parliament? So, I think each January they have. Uh, this election, or maybe every two years, I'm not sure, I have to double check. So uh, at the moment, there is uh, the, the leader of the, 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 the parliament 
he's uh, he he's not together with Bolsonaro, and uh, they trying to make a, a block. And basically, this block now it's the center 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 right, and the left. Many of the left parties they are negotiate a tactical correlation with the center right wing parties to defeat Bolsonaro's block uh, inside the Brazilian parliament. So this is uh, there will be a lot of things to debate in June, January around this uh, this what's happening there because this is just a touch go but that's risky because many of them they were the, the the politicians and the people the parties that actually they they organize and they manage the coup in 2016 and so there's a lot of things but the workers party is expected to get a better position to block uh, more privatizations, loss of rights, and, and keep the democracy in Brazil because it's uh, it is there is a risk of another coup um, because of the military in the in the, in the government, etc. So that's uh, that's what's happening in Brazil, and um, I hope you it's um, it's 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 a um, contribution for the for the debate. Marvelous contribution, Nora. I know you're very tired, but you I am very. all the points were there and, and many questions which will be in our mind, which we need to debate further, uh, such as, you know, what is the politics, you know, what do we, what attitude do we take uh, to uh, these coalitions and, and, and the like? When we That's what we're debating now. Yeah. Those are very difficult uh, points for, you know, the left parties and often end up in, in, in major problems. Um, but then there's also this question which I raised, which uh, maybe we can just keep on our minds, and that is the question of uh, Bolsonaro cutting back on the emergency payments, uh, apparently quite drastically. So, uh, you know, that's certainly going to be a position where there'll be a lot of resistance from below. But anyway, these are points for us to debate further. And I'm just because of time, I think we need to move on to uh, Silvana, uh, who's then going to speak on the position of women in Brazil uh, at this conjunction. Thanks, Silvana. Mm. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, I think uh, to talk about women, we need to start talking about uh, Simone uh, Bonvoir, that she, according to her analyze, uh, women are considered second second sex. Um, a woman lives in oppression, and uh, and they are not seen as um, human beings sometimes. But after many fights, uh, since um, 1837, a woman in America, and then a woman in United um, in the uh, United Kingdom. They start fighting for the right to vote. So we start seeing some change, how women were uh, accepting the society, but because they didn't consider them uh, capable to deal with the politics, they didn't think a woman were, uh, they were smart enough to deal with the, um, abstract uh, constructions, maybe just uh, they were just allowed to work at home. Uh, before the capitalism, women were, they had certain, uh, certain power because they used to make everything uh, inside the home. So they were considered um, essential to the house because they used to make clothes, soaps, and all that uh, they, they were, they could help the men to make the money. So they were seen as um, a, a economic need. But when the capitalism uh, start in the public fabrics, they start like building things outside the home, they lost the power. So uh, the, um, a woman uh, in the middle class, they start fighting for the, women's rights and they want to vote. They had the suffrage in America and here in, um, in America was uh, 1837. And here uh, was about, um, 
idea was about uh, 1880 when they started uh, fighting for the uh, right to vote. Uh, in Brazil, believe it or not, Brazilians, they have the right to vote uh, in 19, 1932 with the um, Vargas, Getulio Vargas, they, uh, according to the Brazilian constitution, a woman have, have women, woman has the same right, uh, women have the same rights as a man. Um, but in reality, we don't because uh, we need to work harder than them. We need to study harder than them. Even though we sometimes have a higher level of education, they still uh, make less money than the men. Um, I'm sorry, I, I had to talk about now. Um, so they, uh, even though they go out and they have to work outside the home, they, um, some women even pay half of the, the bills inside the house, but they still are responsible for the uh, domestic work. Um, um, also, um, a woman that denotes their uh, they, they denotes their personal projects in order to uh, to succeed in a professional life. So they need to wait to get uh, pregnant uh, for the motherhood or to get married because they cannot combine the two uh, things together because uh, otherwise they would not have the same opportunities that the men. Um, also, um, they are responsible for their children, for the house, um, for everything that has happened inside the house. Um, a woman, uh, they earn less than 30% than the men. Um, is, uh, is worth it to mention that even though they live, uh, they, they work in the same position of the men, they still earn less than them. Um, a woman, they recognize that they, they earn money and they are independent and they are pride, pride of it, but uh, they, still, uh, they still have so many struggle. Um, but in 19, uh, in 2013, uh, the, um, the PT government, they came up with this idea because in Brazil, we have a lot of domestic violence and uh, they even, uh, uh, they created, uh, even though if you kill someone, you can uh, be penalized as a crime. But because many men in Brazilian, uh, Brazilian society, they believe the woman is their prop property. So they end up killing the woman. So we have many social problems uh, being a woman in Brazil. So if the man, if the woman wants to end up their relationship, they can be killed by their, um, by their spouse or, or their companion, whatever you wanna call. And so they create this uh, law that protect, if, if the man killed the woman, they would stay longer in a prison. But in Brazil, you see, they can just stay up to 30 years in the prison. So they don't care if they kill a woman because they're gonna be out of the prison after five years in some case. Um, but in 2013, to minimize these crimes and minimize the pressure of a woman, um, PT created uh, the Congress and the and Lula. Uh, he signed a law, Bolsa Familia, that would have woman would have uh, extra cash that she could um, um, spend in um, uh, in electricity, water and uh, on, 
Metro City, water and transport, that she could uh, perhaps take care, of, uh, take care of the children, take uh, take care, of, even find a job or um, take some rest. Um, the thing is, like we gotta divide a woman because some women are black, some women are uh, middle class. Some women are the work power. So, I mean, depends which class you belong to. I think you suffer less or more. But with the feminicide, doesn't matter which class you belong to yeah, or, or the domestic violence, you still have those types of uh, aggression against women. Um, what else did I find out? Um, After Bolsonaro went to power in 2018, uh, a woman started being killed more. Why? Because he doesn't have no respect for women. He goes out and uh, say like things like, uh, um, because when the feminicide start, started, he said, you know, because men doesn't have a job, so he end up killing the woman or he end up hitting the woman because they don't have enough money to sustain the family. But guess what? In Brazil, Brazilian woman, even the poorest, the poorer you are, the more work you do, the more work you have to, do, to work. But, but because you are sometimes don't have a, a good education, you don't make as much money as a, a woman that has a higher education. So you work every day from 5 a.m. to 11 p.m. But in the end of the day, uh, you bring home, let's say, divide uh, 1,000 real by seven. You end up with, um, um, let me see how much. Um, 600 pounds a month. I believe, I'm not sure. So it's not enough for to take care of your children. So in the end of the day, a woman are tired and you need to, even if you are tired, uh, in Brazil, 35 years old, you are old. Men, they look at woman as an object because, um, uh, if you are 35 years old, they consider yourself old. We have this um, uh, psychologist and she also is a um, philosopher. She said that uh, a woman, they may look a woman like uh, a woman is in a, in a shelf. So they put the woman like, let's say you are blonde and you have blue eyes. So the less, the less characteristics you have, according to the men, you are, you, you, you are worth less. So by the end of the day, if you are black or if you are fat, or if you are, you know, you, you don't have the same uh, condition, even to, to find a husband or to find a boyfriend or, to have a better life. Even if you wanna find a job, they're gonna look how you are in order to give a job. Another thing that I realized those days, and even she talked about this, is like the man, he, when even when he becomes a trans, he can even have power in our society. But if a woman, she tries to become, a, if she's bisexual or if she's a lesbian, she cannot, she doesn't have the same uh, uh, vision in society. So woman is always going to lose in uh, Brazilian society. So there is a lot of work that we need to do in a school, like about uh, gender, about uh, race, and about uh, woman's quality. So I hope I, I gave a little insight of uh, a woman's, um, about uh, woman Brazilian society. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Silvana. I, I learned a lot, especially about the date. I think it was uh, 1837. 
and how, uh, in many ways, um, you know, Bolivar seemed to be a great liberator, was actually very far from from the case, you know, um, and and that, you know, the women will have to raise all the economic uh, questions as well as the formal rights, you know, to be able to change the, you know, the position. Yes, because when a woman, uh, like in America or even uh, in Brazil, when uh, the middle class, the woman from the middle class, that's the one they started looking for uh, to have the right to vote. But they didn't, uh, that's why it's wrong at this moment. Not that uh, you don't need to look at the, the race, yeah. but you also need to look at the class because I think the class, if you look at the social class, you can um, kind of um, uh, have a fight for everybody at the same time, you know? Yeah. Well, that's, uh, thank you. Now, look, I'd like to um, do the following. Um, because we, we, we've had some really excellent uh, contributions, uh, I've got a lot of points I'd like to make, but I'm sure others do too. But we don't have an enormous amount of time before we all fall asleep. Um, could I do the following? Could I ask uh, Myra to, to come in with some comments and then for Roger to, to give some general points about all of these uh, contributions and then and then let's let's see where we go. Could we do that? Mm -hmm. Hi, good, good evening everybody. Thank you Richard for that insight about about the forest in, in, in Brazil and also thank you very much Nara as well. Uh, for you talking about what is the political issues in, in Brazil, because actually I am from Ecuador, we, we, are, happy, we are having exactly the same problems. And Silvana as well, uh, my solidarity with Brazil, because unfortunately we share the common problems among Latin America, being a country where United States feel and believe that uh, Latin America is their backyard, and they treat us as such, you know, with working with the interests of the big corporations in the United States. Because let's be frank, United States is a capitalist society which is basically led by the by maniacs. I call them maniacs capitalists, which it doesn't care about climate change, it doesn't care about women's rights, doesn't care about children's rights, doesn't care whether they poison the water, the air, the land. All they care is about filling themselves with pockets, with money, and then you forget it about human rights. They haven't even signed the human rights, you know. For them, it's very easy to impose a, a human rights around the world, telling us what to do, because they wanted to behave like the big brother, giving them advice in the way they, we should behave. But they actually, they are uh, criminals. They are, they are criminals of, how you say, um, they are mass criminals in this country, you know. They have destroyed many countries, going like uh, Haiti. Uh, we're going to talk to about Vietnam, Iraq, Afghanistan, um, Syria, you name it, with more than 900 military bases in Latin America. Um, in Ecuador, we suffer the same conditions. We have, unfortunately, a government which has sold itself to the devil, as, as uh, Chavez used to call the devil is the north in the United States. Um, uh, Lenin Moreno actually gave the United States the island Galapagos as a military base, and they entered in there, um, convince and trying to convince the people who actually they have a green base, you know, where they're going to protect apparently the water, they're going to protect the island, you know. It is such a ignorance. Uh, they treat us like basically some form of people who cannot even think and we don't have the, any intellect at all. And unfortunately, this is a society that we live, you know. They, we have, um, unfortunately, this government has called the International Monetary Fund. You might know the International Monetary Fund is an organization, apparently, the, la the last resort. They lend money as a last resort, but actually it's, um, it's, an, it's an agency of the United States to, 
to actually work uh, uh, on the interests of the criminals, capitalists who only do is uh, basically uh, collect money and contaminate everything and um, basically exploit our our societies, basically treating us as a post post colonialist. Uh, we basically are as, as, as slaves in the 21st century in whole Latin America. This is what we are, unfortunately. You know, they take our all our resources, they contaminate everything. You might know what they done in Haiti, a, a country totally destroyed, living in total misery, and this is what they actually doing. And with COVID-19, it actually has been a totally atrocious with this government as well, perhaps even the same as Bolsonaro, where uh, uh, Lenin Moreno has actually reduced more than one billion expenditure in education, health, and yeah. everything to follow the conditionalities given by the International Monetary Fund. Um, the International Monetary Fund had obliged the government to privatize all our resources, and at the moment we have resor we have privatized our. Uh, um, we are privatized the oil and transport. Uh, yeah, transport. Basically, you know, I could go. I could go on with the list, and I don't really wanted to steal your time, guys, because I wasn't in the list to talk about anything. But yes, we share the same common problem, and we, as the people, as the as Rachel said, we don't have time about socialists going forward. We have. We need changes. We need to make the changes now. We need to actually. Join together as a community, as a, as, a, as a society, to stop this criminal destroying the only planet that we have to live. Thank you very much. I think that's it. <laughs> okay, <clears throat> some marvelous uh, points there, Mara. Uh, although, as we say, we uh, can't wait for socialism. I'm afraid uh, the environment won't wait for us. <laughs> so we have to act uh, because capitalism is driving all these processes. But uh, look, there's been some marvelous contributions. Could I uh, say that, um, you know, we let's have uh, Roger come in now and, and some time for general discussion. And then I think uh, we should draw in how we contribute some of our discussion in the coming conference. Roger? Mm. Um, yes, comrades, it's been a really uh, fascinating uh, discussion and I've learned a lot. I'm not a, um, I have to admit, I'm not an expert on Latin America. I have a lot to learn about it. And I, um, I that process certainly, uh, you know, I made several steps forward today, listening to your contributions, comrades. Um, you see, um, I remember I, I joined, um, you know, uh, social, well, I, I was a socialist almost from birth. Like I uh, was born into a socialist, very active um, socialist family. And uh, I, I joined what was um, then uh, called Militants, which was a, um, a, um, a Marxist organization, at, you know, in my teens. And I stayed with them. I worked actually, f um, I was a member for about 30 years. I later had developed differences with them and they developed differences from what they had stood for before. That's another long story. Uh, but um, I was a full-time worker for them for 20 years. Now, I, I remember how closely we followed events in Chile in, uh, in, the, 19, in the early 1970s. We were jubilant at the um, election of Salvador Allende in, in Chile. Uh, and we followed very, very closely everything that happened, all the uh, mass forces that brought him to power, all the uh, different political, uh, you know, at that time, I could have been quite an expert on the history of individual left politicians and particular left parties and breakaways from other groups and so on, and what popular unity stood for. And we were very absolutely um, also very insistent that uh, Allende, for all the fact that he was um, a sincere and courageous uh, representative of the working class of uh, Chile, it was so clear the mistakes that he was making and what the horrific consequences were going to be 
eventually. And I wrote articles. I, I at that time I was sort of considered in Millicent to be to be um, a bit of the expert on Chile, and I followed it very closely. And I wrote articles of the whole, you know, saying how they, you know, they they allowed him to come to power on the basis that he had um, that he guaranteed the um, existing powers of the military, of the judiciary, and uh, of the um, the uh, press. And uh, that being the case, all of those forces were there uh, working from the beginning to undermine him. And of course, with the um, generous assistance of um, their friend Kissinger in the north. And um, you know, when the uh, when the Chilean coup came, I'm afraid that we were not surprised by that. So we were devastated, but at the same time, we 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 were desperate to try to find people that we could uh, talk to and sympathise with. I made I I um, had long discussions with uh, many um, emigres, many exiles from Chile. Who had um, who had managed to escape and um, settle in in Britain and in other countries of uh, Europe? So I'm saying all that just to say um, that I've had a fascination with Latin America. I'm not. I haven't kept up mainly because we in Win have not had until now. We've not had um, many contacts with uh, people from Latin America. And we, our work has mainly been in North America and in Europe and in um, South Asia. And uh, it's, it's, it's part of the process of the growth of WIN, and we're really excited about that, that we're now developing contacts and finding, um, finding co-thinkers in one country after another after another. And I must say, I mean, uh, it'll sound like flattery, and I assure you I'm not the sort of person to to indulge in flattery at all. But the, um, you know, the, the talent that has been shown tonight in, in all of your contributions and the, um, the, uh, the amount of expertise that you have and your um, skill in explaining it and putting it forward, I mean, that's, that's huge, got to be huge assets for us in, uh, in WIN and huge assets, in other words, for the process of trying to develop uh, a real international movement to the working class. And that's what WIN is for. Well, that's what WIN has been, uh, you know, was created for. We worked um, over many years trying to, trying to get a, um, to expand our base. And now that is happening. Paradoxically, it's in the year of the lockdown. It's in the year of, um, in, in the year when, if it had not been for this um, fantastic weapon in our hands, Zoom, then uh, we we'd have been completely uh, paralysed by uh, by what's by what by what's uh, happened. But actually, on the contrary, as you know, we've had we have our weekly meetings in Win. We've had um, comrades participating from a dozen countries. Uh, we're about to have our Win conference. We're expecting to have at least fifteen or maybe getting on for twenty countries um, represented at that conference. And they're all, you know, we're not collecting trophies. There are many left groups which will just say, oh, you see, we've got somebody here, we've got these people there, and, and they lay down a line and they dictate to them. But for us, on the contrary, we, we, we consider ourselves not so much teachers as learners. And we can learn so much from the experience. So we have to learn. And it's our responsibility to learn and to digest and to absorb, and then, only then, to generalize the experiences that comrades um, have um, uh, can um, concentrate for us and uh, explain to us. So, I mean, I could say a lot more, but really what I want to say is that I'm, you know, welcome to win, welcome to our conference, uh, and um, we are really looking forward to a, a absolutely fruitful exchange of ideas and experiences and together, we are going to change the world. <laughs> so, comrades, okay? Well, I, I just have to uh, send more than uh, verbal applause uh, with my hands too. You know, that's our African tradition. <laughs> um, now, look, um, can I just say, 
um, to follow through with uh, what Roger said, uh, I want to just pay tribute uh, to those who've helped get the network going, and particular Raquel, who's, who's uh, got my son to do things which I would never have got from him if I'd asked directly. <laughs> so we all benefit uh, from, from the links and loves. And what I can say is that we want to take up the points which, uh, you know, I had a bit of an exchange with uh, Nara. And can I say, we love criticism, not blind, crazy criticism. But if it's not right, we want to fix it. That's what criticism is there for. In other words, if you say, why do we work this way? We're not going to say, well, this is the way we work and become defensive. Wynn's tradition is to listen and to harmonize what there is through improving our way we work and through improving the way we exchange ideas and, and, and develop our theories. So, you know, it's so great to have this marvelous exchange. We have some diversity of opinion. Everywhere people are saying, well, look, we, we, we can't wait for socialism. Indeed, we can't wait for socialism because we have to act now with all the transitional method. This is something we all need to study and to develop uh, on how we raise the common demands of the people and tie that up in a bundle, which is actually the socialist transitional program. In other words, that makes things move. And all those dead institutions, which are just holding us back, uh, break. And so we can move forward. And all that energy of the people actually turns towards political revolution and, and, and social change. So I just want to pay a tribute then to Raquel. I paid tribute to Nora, to, to Silvana, uh, to Mara, to all of us who've come together because Nara, you've said that you want to bring people in. The door is wide open. <laughs> Please bring in those comrades that are there in struggle. That's what, what we want. Silvana, I know that you're even going from in Oxford, going from door to door. You're a passionate organizer. You're doing stuff which uh, is very brave and, 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 and sometimes I'm sure tiring. But just remember that work with us and in us so that you can get, I wouldn't say shortcuts, but to link up those nodes and internodes. That's the point I think I've learned uh, from Raquel, you know, that we, we make those links, uh, organic links, you know, that, that exist in society and bring them to uh, political oh, fruition. We lost you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's frozen. <laughs> okay. And then to Mara, I just want to say thank you for. That's all we're waiting for. Oh, there we are. Yeah. Um, and then to Mara to be able to contribute. I'm sure you've got lots. I'm sorry. I see my internet's not the best. Let me just go offline. I mean, do this. Um, so you can't see my face and my hands waving, but maybe you can hear me better. So Mara, I just want to thank you as well for, for joining the group. Please bring more people from Ecuador and throughout the region, because one thing I've found with our Latin American comrades is that you speak to one, you speak to 10. You speak to one in one country and you're already speaking to five in another country. So let's bring that continent together. We've mentioned Bolivar. Well, we have to continue that mission in a totally different way to a fruition. How is the continent to be united against imperialism, against the ravages of capitalism and, and the killing and the genocide of, of indigenous people? How are we going to do that? Well, through actually uniting, uniting the poor and the oppressed, and then the strength of the working class to be able to bring people together. So that's what I'm looking forward to see. And I just, uh, maybe we could have some last minute contributions. I'm sorry to say that, but I'm sure if you have some more points, please indicate or just come in. And so we can actually hear you before the end of the discussion. Oh, just one last point. The contributions are marvelous. I would love to see those notes put together and maybe we could get them up on, on, the, on the brink, um, you know, our website. So please, you know, you've done some homework, you've formed some ideas. I would love to see, you know, all, the, all this work coming together in a way so that uh, everybody else can benefit through it too. I have recording as you'll see, uh, and I hope that other comrades who are not participating can also benefit from this too. Uh, other contributors? Mm. Okay. I think Rachel wants to have a little word. <laughs> Sorry, just repeat. Uh, I, I think Rachel. <laughs> I would like to say something. I don't know if you. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay, great. So, 
first I want to say thanks for Dave and Roger and, and Silvana, Nara and Mayra for the invitation and for this discussion. And I would like to, to say that it's very it's like really inspiring to be in a part of group in with Latin Americas and and other countries together to try to change the things just before the socialism <laughs> to do like a better socialism. <laughs> and I really want to, I don't know if uh, Roger sent already like a email or a link for the conference, because if yes, I have to remember if it's my on my email or not, because I want to share it with some friends in Argentina as well and in Brazil for sure, but I have those contacts. Maybe I can bring these people. And just some, some like three points that I would like to remember about the discussions is when we were talking, when Nara told we need to talk about the impact of COVID in Brazil and everywhere. And I was listening the link that um, Dave sent me uh, in BBC, they were discussing uh, COVID, forest, and everything. And was a, a, a journalist called Ricardo. I can I can hear well his surname, but Ricardo was the first name. And he says, uh, someone asked him about COVID in Brazil, and he said, like, um, it's very interesting what's gonna be what's happening there because everything is open. People. It's like, if you go there, it's a bit crazy because people usually are doing parties and meetings and going to like, and even they lost beloved people, relatives, um, maybe because the poverty, the very small short help from money, this money from the government, which is not the money from government, but it's money from people and the pressure, the international pressure makes the president uh, give this help to the people. But because the poverty in Brazil now is, very, is much higher than in the past, the people maybe is more afraid about hunger, to be hungry and in very limited situation than about COVID. Because they have this expectation, ah, maybe I'm not gonna die for COVID, but I'm, I have to have like money to buy any food, like or the lunch or the dinner or something not possible to. And some people doesn't know if they want to have like money for any food. So this may, this could be yeah, a broad discussion in the future, but I, I thought like very interesting what he said. It's like, a, it's very short money, but still is some money than nothing. And the other thing that I want to share about women, women in Brazil is, um, I have an example from my life. My mom, she was a teacher in the school and she was giving classes from morning, afternoon and evening, like 50 hours a week and like crazy. And for, and she has like two daughters, me and my sister. And for a big period uh, with the Newton Cardoso, when he was government uh, of Minas Gerais state, he just stopped to pay the, the salary to the teachers and say, no, I'm not going to, I'm not gonna pay the, the salary because we are in crisis. And all of the, the teachers, which mostly was female, like women, uh, they are just lady, ladies waiting for a husband. So I don't need to pay them. And it's this, and I, I remember my mom was really struggling to feed my sister, myself, my granddad and my dad who was not working. So it was really hard times. And even I was small, I remember this man telling this in the TV, and yeah, this is like what is woman in Brazil struggling um, as, na as Silvana told. And the other last thing is like a, um, 
the law of abortion in Brazil, when was Lula and Dilma Rousseff government, the left wing uh, government, uh, was very was a kind of improved in the it's not a law to allow abortion, which is which is bad because which we should be you should have like a law um, saving women's life, but actually it was a law criminalizing women women about abortion. And during Lula and Dilma, they they discriminalize abortion in case of risk for a mother's life for uh, from rape or disease such like hydrocephaly for in the babies. So they were not the woman will be not criminalized, not in the prison. If it was this three case, which, which is nothing actually, and was a lot of pressure to do a permission for abortion, abortion to like women decide about their lives. And actually with Bolsonaro, he kicked even this, this discriminalization for the three things, which is horrible. It, you have to go to the prison if you have abortion for, if you haven't risked your life, if you were, if you have been raped, was a girl with 30, 11 years old, which almost went to the prison because she was in risk of life and death. And also she was raped for the uncle. And this is a horrible, horrible scenario with Bolsonaro. And he told this week that, yeah, uh, if this is not gonna happen never in Brazil when he's in the power, the same what's happened, what happened last week in, in Argentina with the discriminalization of abortion. And yeah, and really thanks for Maida uh, about Latin America and all of the sharings because it's the same situation in Brazil. We are, it's like all of Latin America countries, if you read like the open veins of Latin America from Galeano, we can see the entire link between us. Even we speak Portuguese and the other countries, Spanish, we have like very ex story of explo exploitation and crimes like this. Thanks. Thanks so much, uh, Raquel. I really do appreciate all the points and, and um, well, if I could just say, you're, you're, what you said about your mother and your family shows that we're all just on the precipice in the sense that, you know, all, all of those people who have struggled so hard to build a new life or to build a life for their family, it could all be in ruins in, in a matter of months because of the capricious action of capitalist governments. It's unbelievable that we can have to live like that. Um, can I say something and maybe, I don't know if anyone else got one last contribution. Could I, could I just draw things together? Remember that we are preparing for the uh, conference. Um, there's some marvelous contributions. You, you won't be able to just say what you've said now because of the time, because there'll be international delegates from all, all around. So try and think of what the, what's really going to make a difference when you speak um, in terms of raising the consciousness, raising ideas, and so forth. So be as, as economical as you can. I used to train myself by you know, talking in front of a mirror, you know, and then trying to get five points out, actually usually it ends up three, uh, across uh, in a mass meeting or even in a, in, in a debate or something of that kind. So try and think in that way. I know it's, it's horrible because you've had to sacrifice some good points, but try to think of what are the primary issues that we can get across. And I know that that will be so welcome in the discussion. Can I say something else, which is that, you know, the discussion tonight uh, is such a tribute to the education of women, which I think is probably the most progressive thing which has been forced on capitalism, to actually force the child, the, the girl child to be, to be trained and developed and, and to be able to reach some of the potential, you know, that is possible. I, you know, I'm, I'm, it's something which is very dear to me with four daughters, but also when I see, you know, poor, poor children being denied you know, the right to be able to develop and to be able to take society forward. It's not just that it's a shame that they are not trained. That it's all that enormous energy and, and uh, productivity, productive ideas and, and, and contribution to society. And that's what we're witnessing tonight. And, uh, you know, I'm so pleased to see it. 
So please, I might have some laws that I'd like us to work this way or that way. Please, it's your group, so please contribute. If you have a better idea, please put it there. And if I would like to see some initiative in the next few days before we have the uh, conference to draw on more people, pull in more people, the doors wide open, um, I will have this recording. I know someone maybe feels that maybe it wouldn't be the very best, but maybe let's do it that way. People can then catch up with this discussion because it's been a very rich discussion. And then we can prepare adequately for the uh, conference itself. Uh, are we agreed on that? Yeah? Mm. I, I think so. Okay, well, look, um, we, we can't quite yet sing the international together, but we have that spirit in us. <laughs> can, can I MSG spirit. Uh, Roger? Mm. I just wanted to say, because listening to what Raquel said just now, a very true and a very important point that she said that um, people are not have have not got the um, the they don't feel they have the space to worry about COVID because they're worrying where their next meal is coming from. Now take a step back from that. How much less are people who are engaged in a daily struggle just to keep alive and feed their families and all the rest of it? How much less? Can they be worried about uh, the Amazon and the rainforest and uh, and so on? And that's the problem. And yet, actually, the revolution in Brazil is a matter of life and death to all of us on the planet. And that's something we all we have to um, keep in mind. The, the The world has never been so united as it is now. The working class and the interests of the working class has never been bound together so so closely. And so tightly as now, and um, that's why, you know, the revolution in Brazil is uh, a top priority for all of us. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Roger. Um, well, look, I, 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 the only reason I'm I'm wanting to close now is because I think Nara will drop from exhaustion, <laughs> and uh, I, I, and maybe we've had the very best of the discussion. So thank you, one one and all, and uh, let's look forward to further exchanges on the group and to marvelous uh, participation in the conference which is coming on the 10th. So we look forward to your, all of you being there and another five to one. In other words, for every one person here, we'd like to see five additional ones, if you could do that. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you, David. Well, would you be able to send the, 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 the timetable for the for the, the conference, etc. So um, yeah, I can tell you very, very briefly that because we've got four sessions of three hours each, and um, the first two will be um, around the political perspectives uh, documents, which is uh, 2020 vision, the uh, world perspectives, and a, a, um, a supplement to that, which uh, David is producing, which will be out any moment, I yeah. believe, right? <laughs> and uh, that will be circulated. The second two sessions will be on um, on organizational questions, uh, including the manifesto, um, which you uh, you receive copies, yes? So, uh, yes, you have. You, if you, it's in oh, the, yeah, yeah. Um, the newsletter the that, I, that I sent out a few days ago. And that's, uh, that's a draft, um, Constitution, if you like, or manifesto, whatever you want to call it, for for win, and and other things like um, you know structure, organisational questions. So um, that's the basic timetable. Okay, thank you. Do come to all the sessions, okay? Yeah. Oh, sorry, Roger. Where do I find the link for the brink? Uh, well, sorry. Uh where do I, sorry, where do I find the the manifesto in the brink? Am I including some form of email that I can um, like? Look, I maybe I'll send you. I'll send it you again. I think I sent it already, but I'll send it. I'll send it to you, Myra. Don't worry. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna forward there in the group again. I have it. Right. In hand, okay. yeah. It's there now. I put Thank it there. Thank you, Nara. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks. Thanks so much. Thank All you. Right, Thank you very much.
Thanks, Mara. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a lovely weekend and successful 21st, 21. <laughs> oh, yeah. Happy New Year to everyone. Uh, happy New Year. Year yes. you this is the year that we get revenge. No, I think we can't off. wait for a revolution in Brazil because people are fired up. <laughs> no, I'm actually no, done for it. It's coming. And we just have to be up to it when it comes. <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.